I want to send a special thank you to ClayShare for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Through their online ceramic education platform, they offer hundreds of full-length classes, as well as thousands of instructional videos that can be streamed straight to your smart TV or compatible device. They offer a wide range of topics that are perfect for the beginner to the experienced potter. With your membership, you'll receive weekly live tutorial broadcasts, access to virtual workshops with well-known artists, and special discounts on ceramic supplies. If you sign up today, use the offer code RAMBLER25 to receive a 25% discount on your first three months. For more information, check out ClayShare.com. Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 369 of the podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in. Today on the show, I talk with Castles. They're a performance-based artist in the LA area. Their work often uses physical force and exertion as a metaphor for struggle and survival. In our interview, we talk about how their work is in dialogue with artists from history, as well as how the body can be both a material and a tool within the context of their performance. To see examples of the work, visit castles.net. Before we get to that interview, I wanted to put a plug out there for the Tales from the Vault podcast feed. This is an exclusive perk of the folks that are supporting this show on Patreon, and it features ad-free remastered episodes that are no longer available on major podcast servers. Season 1 has been completely remastered and is now available so check that out by making a donation at patreon.com slash redclayrambler. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. So in your talk, you referenced James Luna, and you said a quote from him that uh, in performance, you show by example, and that made me think a lot about the notion of performance itself. Can you talk about when in your career you realized performance was could be more impactful than either an image or an object alone? You know, I was trained, well, initially as a young artist, I had no training, right? I, I, I just drew intrinsically. I feel like I was drawing before I could write. Um, writing and drawing became uh, a form of expression from a very early age. And being pretty severely dyslexic and not super gifted at traditional academics, it was the one thing that I was rewarded for. And so I think that that also fostered in me the sense at a young age that this is something I had a gift for and something I could continue to do. Although I did not really have a lot of examples of people who were living working artists around me at all. And so I thought painting and drawing was the be all and end all until I got to art school, which was when I was about 18 years old. And um, it just so happened that the permanent art school in Canada, which is located in Halifax, Nova Scotia, also happened to be a sort of safe haven and bastion for um, conceptual artists from New York City who were uh, dodging the Vietnam draft back in the 70s. And so it became this, this very experimental site for performance and um, works that were process-based, works that engaged with humor, very much a sort of conceptualist entry point in really abandoning sort of traditional modes of production. And and so I was there in the 90s. And since then, the school has kind of gone through a massive pedagogical shift. It's become a university. There are now much more traditional syllabi and expectations of different kinds of uh, working modalities. 
But at that time, it was still really rogue. And I think through the education that I had, unbeknownst to me, um, through this very sort of wild and um, imaginative artists who were teaching at the school, I, I, I quickly kind of drank that Kool-Aid and, and became intrigued and uh, it formed an impression on me. And so then after graduating from my undergraduate degree, I moved back to Quebec, to Montreal, where I'm from. And it was very difficult to get a job outside of school. And so rather than wait tables in Montreal, which I did for a while, I decided, you know, screw it, I'm gonna go to New York City. If I'm gonna wait tables, I'd rather wait tables in New York City. And there I ended up interning for the Franklin Furnace, which is the largest nonprofit uh, organization for performance art that I know of in North America, if not the world. At that time, again, in the late 90s, this was before the dawn of the internet had really taken hold in the way that it had. And Martha Wilson, the founder of the Franklin Furnace, would throw these really incredible performance performances. She would host performances in the loft space, which was in Wall Street District on Franklin Street, hence the Franklin Furnace. There was one piece that was so wild, it raised eyebrows and burnt hair. And people called the police to report uh, and the way that they could get around it was to say, you know, there's, there's too many people in this building. And so because capacity had been breached because so many people wanted to see this art and it was reported, they slapped the Franklin Furnace with such a huge fine that they couldn't really continue to open. And, and so very early on in the internet, Martha Wilson, nothing stops her, she decided to take everything online. And so my job as a young intern for about three and a half years was to take all the Porto Pack video footage from the 1970s conceptualist performance arts movement, digitize it and put that online. And so I had a very unofficial but incredibly formative education in, in the possibilities of performance um, from practices as diverse as Linda Montano to William T. Jones. Um, and so this really instilled in me um, a much larger scope, a much greater imagination uh, and understanding of what was possible and uh, that was exciting. So that's kind of how all that happened. Does that archive still exist? Like, can people see that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Franklin Furnace is alive and well, and it's, um, it's all online. You can also, as an artist, you, they have grants. They have excellent grants they give to, to young performance artists who are just starting out. And there's also um, a newsletter that you can get on where they're constantly sending out both the, the sort of achievements of the alumni of those who have received the, the grants over the years. And some of the most well-known performance artists in the world first got their start through the Franklin Furnace. Uh, so you can learn about you know, ongoing activities, but you can also learn about opportunities for funding, um, calls for exhibitions, all of that. So they're a very important node and um, aspect of the network should you be interested in performance art. I had a job in undergrad. Similarly, I was a, a librarian at the SLAD library. So all the teachers would bring back their images and I would have to refile them. And there's something interesting about learning about art, especially in your case, performance through a relic of the performance. So digital or photograph or, or something like that. One thing I noticed is that you're often interacting with art history. You know, like a lot of your pieces are in direct conversation with older pieces of performance artists. Uh, and I wanted to focus on, on a few of those. The um, piece that was carving, which is... Um, Anton, I can, uh, Eleanor Anton's piece uh, from the 70s. You, you've made a piece that was in conversation with that. Can you talk about carving and then how that turned into cuts? So when was it? I want to say it was 2011. I was invited by Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions to respond to the work in their archive. Um, LACE, as it's known, was part of a larger cultural initiative here in Southern California, uh, instituted by the Getty Institute. Um, it was a, a kind of all Southern California wide arts effort called Pacific Standard Time, which still happens uh, and it's thematized. And this particular theme was a period of time and I'm gonna botch the numbers, but it was around like the seventies to the early nineties. And so I was asked by Lace who was participating in PST to respond to their archive and pick a few works to use as a sort of springboard for a new work. And so I became interested in the sort of fledgling movement of the feminist movement as it started in the 70s in Southern California. Also having a background in 
athletics. My day job is I run a personal training business, have done for 23 years. I'm also like an ex-semi-pro boxer. Um, and I have this entire sort of lifetime invested in both art and athletic pursuit. And I was interested in how at the same time the feminist movement was developing and gaining traction in Southern California, so was bodybuilding. That was the time of um, Muscle Beach. It's the era of Schwarzenegger and the crew down on Muscle Beach. And so this idea of, of these various modes of expressions as they were sort of embodied through duration and, and really working with the modality of the body became interesting to me to think about these two um, fledgling movements that were kind of coming from the very same space, but moving in very different directions. Um, so Anton's work, Carving a Traditional Sculpture, is a work where she crash dieted for 72 days, taking a photograph of her body from four anatomical positions every day to showcase her body as it wasted. This was an analogy to the traditional ways in which we approach a, sculpt, a sculpture, looking at a block of marble and anticipating its beauty and genesis and form that the sculptor then brings out and, and, and creates through the block of marble. Then applying to that to the sort of societal expectations placed on a woman's body back in 1972, she was speaking to the sort of expectations to be, to be thin, uh, to be palatable, to, to, to subscribe to femininity in a particular way, to be delicate. And so she used her body and the material of her body as, as a sort of raw material to, to invoke this conversation about societal pressure being a formation of form, of body, and of self. And so carving a traditional sculpture was very much that work. The other work I was in conversation with was a piece called uh, Linda Bangla, it was by Linda Banglis, an artist who was practicing around the same time. I believe her work, which was called Advertisement, was made in 1974. And very much dealing with similar issues, these ideas of the pressures placed on women specifically, and specifically the sort of, um, Banglis was more in dialogue as well with the sort of sexism that was inherent in the, in the industry. The, the glass ceiling, as it were, as she watched her male counterparts, you know, boost through those ceilings and have more and more exposure. And yet, no matter how talented she was, she wasn't able to make those same strides. This is a problem we continue to face today. Um, and, and so what she did is she purchased uh, two, two full page advertisements in the back of Art Forum magazine, which was the sort of Bible of the art world at the time, again, before the internet. So magazines and periodicals have very loaded um, meaning and, con and content and, and you know, being featured in one was huge. And so because she could not get into one in, in a review as, as she should have and, and, and well-deserved, she, she sort of tongue in cheek took out these ads. And then she took a photograph of herself naked uh, with these cat eye sunglasses on, tan lines, a very traditional sort of pinup. And she has this massive double-ended phallus, which she's inserted into her genitals. And it looks kind of like she's, you know, masturbating or jerking off, but she's also, it's, it's very much a sort of screw you to the male art world. And it's, it's funny, it's hilarious. And it's a scathing piece of criticism. So these were the two works that I was interested in because they were from the same era, but had radically different approaches to these, these, um, this issue of societal pressure and the sort of limits that were being put on them. And, and so what I did for my work was, um, was to ask this question, so why, you know, where is it, rather than talking about the societal positions around, around like how to subscribe to being a beautiful woman, I was interested in when does when does, where is that line in the sand around gender? Where does that exist? And this is of course back in 2011, before we had words like non-binary, before we had words like gender non-conforming. To be trans was really to occupy one end of the binary and both within cis culture and the trans culture, it was kind of viewed as suspicious if you weren't fully medically transitioning, uh, fully committing to, to hormones or surgery. And I was interested in exploring and furthering Anton's use of the body as material and thinking about my own relationship to gender, which was such that I am trans, but also one where I felt much like Anton and Benglis that my body wasn't the problem. My identity wasn't the problem. It's the larger societal construct, which is the issue here. 
And so I decided to work with my body as material in the way that Anta did, but rather through this feminine act of starving, I instead underwent um, a, a training protocol of an 180 pound male athlete where I ingested the caloric intake of a 180 pound male athlete. I actually went to Venice Beach, the Mecca of bodybuilding. And I worked with uh, an amazing uh, trainer named Charles Glass, who is you know one of the original members of the Pumping Iron crew from back in the seventies. And he is someone who trains people for the Arnold Cup. He also has a degree in engineering. So he he's a he's a bodybuilder, of course, but he really thinks about the of the of physiology, of kinesiology, of the body as a sort of instrument and as a machine, and is excellent at creating symmetry and balancing and really thinking in this very sort of objective way around what it would be to make the body a sculpture, so to speak. And then for the last six weeks of the six-month period, I um, undertook um, a round of steroids, which was a bit of a difficult decision for me because being a holistic person that has a holistic relationship to my body was something I didn't really want to do. But just had, as, as Anton had sacrificed and had starved, I felt like this sort of next step in the sort of material finessing of, of, of that development of musculature was necessary. And also to convey that we live in such an extreme society and that you know, to, to demonstrate that extremity is to, is to perform an aspect of the world we live in. So it felt like a necessary step. And so I too took a photograph of my body from four anatomical positions and created a gridded black and white image, a uh, series of images that very much nod formally to Anton's work called um, Cuts, a Traditional Sculpture. And then there's also on the 161st day of my performance, which was about six months in, I worked with an incredible makeup artist and photographer named Robin Black, where we staged a photograph, which was a homage to Lin Linda Banglis's pinup, um, in which I, I, instead of like having this double-ended um, dildo, I, I'm at like the height of my physique and I'm wearing um, a jock strap with like a soft pack. So it, it appears as if I have like a phallus and, and also this like really outrageous, exaggerated lipstick. So it really plays with gender. It's a very confusing image, but also a very beautiful image. It's also a very slick image. And so I was interested in this idea of the finished product versus the process. And so these two works uh, are shown together in dialogue. And that image, the homage to Bengals, rather than buying, you know, uh, space and art form, I was more interested in the ways in which gender is policed, specifically online. So even in 2011, we were having these sorts of policing, uh, online policing issues. And, and I distributed the images uh, through various online publications. It kind of found its way and wound its way through the internet and ended up on certain sites. There was like a kind of gay male version of hot or not, where I would pass and people would vote me up and up. And then people would scrutinize my chest and realize, wait, are those breasts? And the image would disappear. And so it was a very interesting way of kind of relating to the public and allowing the internet and, the, and people online um, a way of sort of voting and creating a sort of, just kind of reckoning with them where their lines were in terms of what it was that they were looking at. I wanted to talk about your internal process during that piece, you know, because there six months of dedicated training to build muscle mass is not your average workout. Like this is way beyond your average workout. So can you talk about what your what your dedication was to that process? Because I'm sure you had an idea of what your physique could look like and what that would mean conceptually. But that on day one means something different than on day 150, where you've already seen results. But results are incremental. Like you don't ever, I guess you had images, but how did you stay motivated and what was your internal process through that, that shaping of the body? I wasn't so much thinking about, I want this. It wasn't, it was actually not about trying to fully transition, for example, it was more an experiment in process. And so I was less hung up on um, getting to a particular finish point. It, the sort of envelope of time was, was the sort of parameters in which I put around it in six months seemed like a sort of commitment that I could make, you know, and also a commitment in which a certain amount of time would pass that would allow for that. I am an athlete and so I have had a very rigorous relationship to my body. So this training with Charles, I mean, it was different. I certainly 
got a lot stronger than I, I thought I was capable of in certain ways, like doing a 650 pound leg press, for example, and that's pre-steroids. But I, I, I've always been someone who's really committed to very rigorous and disciplined practices. So that part of it was not new for me. The sort of having to eat so often, having to force feed myself, having to drive to Venice while still maintaining my day job, having to take photographs daily, all the sort of um, aspects to the project really took over my life. And more than the training, the complete submission to the process, that was at times trying, but you know, it wasn't gonna go on forever, so it was okay. And there was pleasure in it as well. It wasn't, um, you know, there was like pleasure in feeling that strong, you know? So when we work out as humans, like the endorphins in our brain kick off, depending on what type of exercise you're doing. When you're doing steroids, is that different? This is a totally sad question, but like, what was your brain chemistry like because of your physical body chemistry? Honestly, I did very little steroids. Like the amount of steroids that I did was because again, I was a bit scared of them. Um, I, I did the lowest possible dose for a weight height ratio of my size. And I didn't really hyper increase. I'd say it doesn't, I didn't affect my mind. I didn't have like roid rage or anything like that. It didn't do anything to my brain like that. What steroids do, this is the drug that I was taking was particularly a drug that's given to AIDS patients, bodies that are wasting. And that's where steroids are medically given, right? So someone who's wasting away, whose body is unable to maintain mass, steroids literally put the process of muscular regeneration on steroids, right? Allows it to regenerate much faster. And so a lift that would normally take me I don't know, a month or two to accomplish, I was able to do in a week, you know, because the sort of scarification process, when you're exercising, you're creating tiny microfrisions in the tissue, you're soliciting an immune response and your body repairs to prepare for the next round, round of um, stimulus, right? And so steroids expedites the healing process, uh, anticipating larger and larger loads. So what, what was different for me was the fact that I have a very strong connection to the limitations of my body and what's safe. And with this drug in my body, my inner compass was thrown off a little bit because the periphery and the, the, the envelope of what it was that I knew I was capable of suddenly expanded rather rapidly without me understanding where the periphery was. And you hear these stories of people performing lifts that are far too heavy and then drastically injuring themselves as a result, even though the steroid allows them to feel like they can do that. All it does, it's like people think of steroids as cheating. And in a way, I suppose it is. But really what it does is it gives you the capacity to work a lot harder. So all that did was make me work a lot harder. In the last, it allowed me to lift a lot more, eat more, just intensify and yeah, expedite the process. So in that piece, what the viewer is seeing, well, there, there's, you know, there's different uh, documentation of that. There's the images. Um, you've done video work that supports that, that piece as well. But then there's other works of yours, like becoming an image where you are interacting with material, with clay in front of an audience. So can you talk about the difference between um, performance with an audience and how that turns them into a witness for what you're doing versus when they're seeing a photo, it, what they're witnessing is, is already happened. You know, like they're, they're not emotionally as present as something like becoming an image where they're physically right there with you when you're doing the performance. Yeah, I see what you mean, Ben. I think for me, cuts a duration, like cuts was a durational live performance that took place for six months. So although it's end documentation results in a photograph or video, every person that I engaged with on the street was my audience. So someone in the Rite Aid challenging me to an arm wrestling competition, a group of men passing me on the street, totally impressed clearly by my biceps, but then doing a double take because they're like, wait, are those breasts? And then busting out hysterically laughing. I became this sort of moving um, rupture of gender everywhere I went. And so I would say that my audience was enmeshed with my life. 
in that moment. Something like Becoming an Image is a much shorter durational work. It's a work that takes about 20 minutes. And it's a work that's intentionally created with an audience in mind in a more sort of traditional and theatrical sense. And so for a work like that, it requires a completely different training protocol because when you're when you have size, you have strength, but you're also very slow and you don't have a lot of, um, for example, to gain that mass, I couldn't do any cardiovascular training because I, I would instantly catabolize my muscle. And so, uh, so for something like becoming an image, you have to have your heart rate up at about 175 beats per minute. You have to have massive ballistic capacity to leap, to jump. Uh, you, you're, you're doing this performance in pitch darkness, so you have to have excellent balance you're also trying to strike a target and, and you can't see that target. So there's a sense of building up um, a sort of conditioning where you're able to sense where things are in, in space without being able to actually see them. So learning to figure out spatialization without reliance on the eyes, more use of smell and the ears, um, all of that. And so for that work, for example, I would engage in like a rigorous Muay Thai practice, Western style boxing practice, ways of conditioning my tendons and bones. Um, and, and so that's just kind of a bit on the training. But for the actual artwork, I was invited by the One Archives initially, which is the largest LGBT um, plus archive in North America that I know of. It's housed at USC, the University of Southern California. And there was an uh, exhibition there where I was I was asked to respond to the missing trans and uh, gender non-conforming representation in the archive. And this was in 2012. So again, not a lot of discussion around these issues yet. Um, and really not a lot of subjectivities represented within that archive at all. And I was given, you know, trans to be transparent, like a very short amount of time to come up with this work. And rather than making work about the one or two subjectivities that were in this archive, I instead decided to make a work that spoke to what gets left out of an archive. You know, thinking back to Bangladesh, thinking back to that idea of what are all the histories of emissions? What are the truths and the lives of all of those who are never, you know, that are never notated by a statistic or, or, or fall between the flashes of a camera, you know, uh, exposure. And so I gutted one of the rooms of the archive, made it completely pitch black, built a dark room entrance onto the entrance of the room. So you would go into one room, close the door, enter in the other. So you were in complete pitch darkness. Uh, you're, there's a sort of, there's docents that would load you in. As an audience member, you'd place your hand on the shoulder of the person in front of you. And the docent would very carefully guide you into the space. You're completely disoriented and kind of squish you next to the person that you were standing next to. So this kind of uncomfortable sense of, of being forced to touch such that you can almost smell the person, you can feel their pulse through their arm, very un-COVID safe. <laughs> um, once, the, once the audience is loaded in the round, in a circle, unbeknownst to them, they're loaded around a 2000 pound sculpture that's in the shape of a tapered obelisk, the, one of the most ancient sort of forms that we have. And it is made out of a modeling clay called W2ED17, which is like a clay developed by the Laguna Clay Company for Walter Edward Disney. It's a stop motion animation clay. That was just kind of an accident, but the clay worked out because I wanted a clay that wasn't gonna dry instantly and something that would be sort of responding to the action in which I was going to perform upon the clay. And so once the audience is loaded in the dark of this archive, archival room, uh, the sculpture is set, I come in with a photographer and I'm blind, as is the photographer, and I proceed to attack this mound of clay. Um, I hit it and kick it and knee it as hard as I can for as long as I can. And this performance happens in the pitch darkness. The only time the performance is made visible is when a photograph is taken by the photographer, but of course he cannot frame me because he cannot see me. So he's randomly shooting in the dark, but his flash triggers a light that's placed over the sculpture and this double blast of very bright light. What it does is it opens up, it creates like a retinal burn in the audience member's eyes, creating a sort of live photograph that hovers in the retina and maybe drifts off to the left or off to the right, depending on your own physiology and the way your eyeballs work. Some people see it in black and white. Some people see it in purple and green. It's really very much this way of 
rather than using a photograph as a sort of stand-in for an artwork, it's really calling into question the sort of ways in which we think about and witness what is happening in the world and the role of mediation in that and the role of mediation in the way that we tell our histories and the way that we tell our truths and the way that we tell our stories. And of course, this act of attacking is, is, is really speaking to, or what I was thinking about at the time, was speaking to the amount of violence that was being committed and continues to be committed against the trans and gender non-conforming community. Uh, and I was kind of trying to point to that aspect. And, um, and, 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 you know, rather than it being this sort of curtain up, curtain down, you're sitting in your seat chilling and eating popcorn, you're really, your body is being hijacked by the, the very nature of, of the way in which the work is made. And so it makes, you know, a lot of my work is about uh, really trying to activate the audience. And at different points in my career, at different points of my art practice, I've done that in different ways. Sometimes it's a slap in the face. Sometimes it's an invitation to participate. Sometimes it's, um, it's providing education and information. And so it really depends. But I think at this point, I was still in my face slapping stage. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things you mentioned in your lecture, I went to a lecture of yours at the University of Tennessee, and you said witnessing is a choice or, or something around that way. Like to witness something, you have to um, acknowledge that it exists and be present with it. And that is an interesting idea relative to government structures that are just not protecting trans bodies at all. You know, a lot of the violence against trans youth specifically is police violence. And, and I mean, I guess trans folks of, of all ages, it's the, the police are as dangerous in a lot of cities for trans bodies as the public. So can you talk about how this work might engage outside of the art world, you know, like how your work could speak to government organizations or, or people that, that need to think about trans bodies in a different way than they are right now? I mean, I think, yes, there's police violence, but there's also the sort of legislative issues, I think, are the kind of um, crux of what's happening with the last four years of the previous administration. Obviously, there were massive sweeping um, uh, bills that were passed, there were rights that were undone, tons of rights that were undone that had been put in place by the Obama administration, specifically around trans youth. And everybody thinks like, great, now we have Biden, we're safe. But in fact, the courts on the state levels have been packed, packed with conservative judges. And on many, many, many of these states, um, legislatures sit bills that are incredibly damaging for trans youth. We're talking about uh, taking away the rights for young people to, to have gender affirming medications at a young age. We're talking about um, uh, taking away the rights. Uh, where there, there's been certain laws put in place that say that, you know, if you have a child that's born intersex, you're not allowed to perform a surgery to conform it to either a male or female body as you wish. And this has been completely legal up until recently, until that work has been done. Those rights have been ruled back. You know, the, uh, the ability for, um, trans youth to play on, on teams of the gender that, that match their identity, that is being taken away. Since when has the right cared about women's sports? You know, all of a sudden now they want to protect women. It's completely preposterous. And really all of this ire, you know, used to be levied at the gay marriage movement. You know, when the whole LGBT community was like, gay rights, we had this like far right contingent kind of pushing back on that. Once we got gay rights, a lot of the LGB community had what was theirs, they disappeared, and the right turned its ire onto the T, onto, onto the, because it was the most sort of salacious and sort of polarizing um, subjectivity that they, and like in many ways, the lowest hanging fruit that they could attack. But specifically to attack children is a really horrible thing. And so, you know, art, there's many different ways. I'd say something like becoming an image is a work that at the time was kind of speaking to the ways in which uh, violence was being predicated in the dark and that people were unaware. You know, I, alongside my work, I do do quite a lot of advocacy, a lot of calls to action, especially on social media. So for example, you know, I will, I will place an artwork, but then I will also place, you know, inter an interview or a court document with the ACLU. There will be calls to action of which, which sort of politicians that you can, 
you can write letters to, what sort of bills need to be opposed, what sort of phone numbers you can call and make, you know, places you can donate to. These are all sorts of ways. And then again, when I'm releasing the work or I'm making a work in a place, in a, in a country or in a city, I often bring in trans youth to help me manifest the work, manifest the sculpture. They become the docents, they become the care holders of the piece itself. And so there's this way of building the work with the community, making sure that there's that that, that community is invited into the space. So often people who are quote unquote marginalized are, are not made to feel welcome in institutions like art institutions or ivory towers. So I always uh, ensure that there's a certain amount of seats that are made available for free and that those communities are reached out to, that they are invited, they are welcomed and that they, if they are brought into my process of making that they are paid, they are compensated and that they are valued. And so there are many, many ways in which a, a way a work can work on a very personal level to a larger sort of call to action where someone can actually engage with their state legislator, write those letters, make those calls. And, and honestly, I can't dictate what those are, but I can provide the information. And so that's what I try to do with the work. Yeah, it's interesting on your website to see how many theorists have written about your work and how that writing then also becomes a tool to educate legislatures or edu educate the, the broader public. Um, so I want to make sure that, that people check out um, your website. It's, a, it's an amazing uh, visual display of performance over a lot of different areas. Like we're only talking about a few different performance pieces. You, you have been really prolific. <laughs> it's, it's really impressive to see your portfolio and how that developed over, um, you know, the, the time you've been active over, tw I guess, 20, a little more than 20 years now. Yeah, thank you. So I wanted to shift and talk about uh, another of the works, um, which is up to and including their limits. Can you talk about the, the idea for that and then how that was engaged through uh, the Gardner Museum? Because I believe that was the last time you performed that, right? Yes, it's the only time. Oh, it. OK. Gotcha. Yeah. I was invited by uh, the Gardner Museum, which is a ceramics museum in Toronto, Canada, to uh, be part of an exhibition that was a group show, a small group show, exploring raw clay. And so this was very exciting to me because um, it's, it's rather infrequently that I am approached to be in an exhibition that's not purely identity-based. And so it was actually really refreshing to be approached on the basis of my, of my formal practice. Because so often artists are so siloed that, that they're only looked at in one way. And of course, being trans is part of what I am and do, but there's a lot of sort of formal innovation in my work. And so I think Gardner Museum was probably angling for something along the lines of, of becoming an image, but I was curious to con continue my, my exploration with raw clay. And so I proposed a new work, which was the work uh, up to and including their limits which is again, a work that, that is in dialogue with uh, a former work made by an artist named Carly Schneeman, who was an artist who passed away about two years ago, fairly recently. And it was one year anniversary around when I performed this work. And she had done a piece called Up To and Including Her Limits. I forget the exact year, it was in the seventies. And in this work, she's suspended by a, a manila rope in a sort of cornered structure of a museum. And she has in her hands, various drawing tech, uh, she has like markers and crayons and, and colored pencils, different sorts of tools in which to create lines. And she sort of, her body sways and swings in this corner and she's kind of gashing out at the walls and at the floors and through this act of being suspended, she creates this sort of, uh, this gesture drawing that's very much in dialogue with Jackson Pollock's sort of his splash paintings. But it's really taking the piss in a way because it's 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 talking also about the fact that again there is this whereas Jackson Pollock is free and just expressing his masculinity and hurling his paint around, Carly Schneeman is attached at a rope. There is an element of control that's 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 very much a part of the ways in which she's allowed it. It controls how far she can reach. So it's talking about these systems of power in relation to systems of expression in a way that I thought was really great. Um, and so for the gardener, I proposed that we made me a, a box, a plexiglass box, which was about 20 by 20 feet square. It was lined 
with the same clay that I used in becoming an image. Um, so the entire walls are coated top to bottom with this raw clay. There is um, a suspension harness. It is uh, the sort of suspension harness that's used in stunt performances. It allows you to somersault forwards and backwards. It allows for you to, to, to make your body prone so you can kind of fly. It's usually used on green street screens and stunt harnesses to make, 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 make people look like they're flying or, or like, yeah, horizontally parallel to the, to the floor. Um, the harness itself, it's kind of like, yeah, it fits around the waist, but there's also these elements that kind of strap around your legs. And those straps are um, something to be cognizant of because they press on the femoral artery. And if you spend too long in the harness with pressure on the femoral artery, you, su you can suffer from something called suspension trauma, which is, you know, guys that are rigged on telephone poles or trimming trees or whatnot. This, isn't, this is an injury you really want to avoid because it can kill you. Um, and so there was a lot of training that I did working with an aerialist specialist being suspended, building two false walls covered in clay and just ricocheting myself back and forth. And instead of using you know, crayons and markers, I'm using my hands and I'm kind of grasping at the clay. And of course, from the outside, the room is, is lit very, it's actually not lit, it's dark, but the inside of the cube is very, very bright. But you see nothing, you just see this dark cube from the outside. But with every gesture, light pours through the negative space of where the material has been like moved and it creates this sort of like, almost like a painting that you're seeing happening in real time through the removal of this material. And so at first, all you hear is my body kind of ricocheting because as you can imagine, you know, 20 feet is not a very large span. If you take my body, I'm like, a, you know, like five, eight, you know, and so this body swinging back and forth, I have to kind of prepare myself not to, to bash myself into this wall. So there's a lot of kind of timing and nuance that takes place. And then you have to propel and move your body in many different directions to be able to grasp clay at different angles, both you know, reaching up high and close to the ground, all sides of the box. Um, and every about every three minutes, I go down on the ground to just kind of release the pressure of the artery and then go back up again. So there is some element of safety protocol involved. But the whole play, again, the piece is like, much like becoming an image, you're denied visibility until I create those windows through the removal. But every time I grasp at the clay, I hurl it underneath me and I'm essentially building a mound underneath me. And once my body can tip vertical from the prone position and my feet can touch upon the clay, that's when the work ends. So I'm literally building a sort of pedestal for myself. And I'm denying the audience the ability to take in and watch me manifest this stability for myself. However, they are only able to gaze upon me. And when they do see me, it's like I'm like a statue standing on a plinth. So it's sort of referencing classical sculpture and the sort of ways in which we hold up certain ideals or physicalities. But it's denying that sort of prying, objectifying gaze until there is a sort of self-sufficiency that has been secured through myself through the process of making. And it's really beautiful to watch that process. You mentioned it's like a painting and there's, you know, images from the outside and what seems like grasping over time becomes a clearing movement. You know, you're clearing away and you can see, um, which is just a beautiful metaphor. Um, but I wanted to end with one more quick question. Um, if it's not too personal, can you talk about how language shifts in the trans community have helped you to understand yourself better? Because in your talk, you said something interesting. You said trans years are like dog years, meaning that there is a lot going on in terms of your understanding of self. So how does language help you understand yourself? I don't know if I meant it around um, understanding myself. I meant more in terms of a sort of vernacular that's commonly shared. So as I said, in 2011, there was no, there was, there wasn't even a term like cis, right? Which cis means, for those who don't know who are listening, cisgendered, because we have this idea that, you know, you're straight or you're gay, or you're trans or you're not. And this then posits that not being trans is actually what is centralized, what is, which is normalized, which is actually a little bit of a false dichotomy. And so cisgendered simply means that you identify with the gender you were assigned at birth. Transgender or genderqueer means 
that you don't, that you say, you know, just because I was anointed this gender at birth and wrapped in this color blanket, doesn't necessarily express who I am today, right? So those kinds of um, words giving and what they do, it's not just for my own understanding of myself, but for all of us to kind of have a sort of shared dialogue with, um, with the sort of common tools of communication such that we can better express these things. Um, I think what I meant when I said that is there's been such a, pro a proliferation and a growth, I think very much in part fueled by the internet and fueled by the fact that folks are able to have so many more of these conversations, create online communities and, and really um, together with the mirroring of others like you, be able to discuss the nuances and create language for these nuances. And certainly that has happened. And certainly, you know, I've learned a lot from younger generations. Um, there's been a lot of incredible gains and, I, and, and there's also a lot of work to be done. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time today. To wrap up, can you leave your website so pe or social media so people could uh, get in touch and see the work? Totally. Yeah, you can, um, you can follow me at uh, Castles Artist on Instagram. That's probably my main social media jam. And then it's uh, www.castles.net is my website. And then as well, there's another project that I've been working on since last summer, which is a performance work. It's not exclusively, it's like, it's a collaboration, but it's a work about, um, about highlighting uh, immigrant jails across the country. And that's a really cool project. You can, you can look at that at www.xmap.us. Uh, it's another huge national project that we mounted last 4th of July weekend. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate the opportunity. I'd like to thank Castles for coming on the show. It was a pleasure to talk with them about their work. Also wanted to thank the University of Tennessee at Knoxville, which is where I got to see a presentation by Castles probably about maybe a month or six weeks ago. I really appreciate that universities are making their artist presentations available via Zoom. It's an amazing resource for a podcaster like me. So a big thanks goes out to UT Knoxville. Before we go, I also wanted to give a special thank you to today's sponsor, that is Clayshare. Through their online ceramic education platform, you will have access to hundreds of full-length classes that can be streamed straight to your smart TV or compatible device. If you sign up today, use the offer code RAMBLER25 to receive a 25% discount on your first three months. For more information, visit clayshare.com. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. <laughs>